So our next talk will be from Pira Prakash uh, from Purdue University. Um, and sh and be, the title is, What do microglia make when they eat amyloid beta? All right, you, you have the screen up and we're good to go. All right. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes. All right, so um, hello everyone. Uh, thank you to the organizers for having me here and uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Priya and I'm a grad student in Gaurav Chopra's lab in the chemistry department at Purdue. And I'm excited to talk about some of the uh, new chemical tools and techniques that uh, we have developed in the lab uh, to study glial cell biology and specifically um, my work focused on microglial uh, response to amyloid beta. So it is now evident that microglia are, um, they have many uh, fundamental roles in the brain. They actively uh, interact with uh, neuronal synapses uh, and they prune the synapses using uh, complementary proteins and receptors as um, shown by Beth Stevens and others in the field. Uh, reactive microglia also uh, secrete uh, cytokines like IL-1 alpha and TNF alpha that in turn influence astrocyte um, cell state and neuronal health. Um, in a tumor microenvironment, microglia also interact with uh, glioma cells using eat me and don't eat me signals. And um, more specifically, microglia uh, phagocytose misfolded uh, protein deposits from their microenvironment. Um, proteins like amyloid beta and alpha synuclein. So with this in mind, uh, one of the overarching questions in our lab is uh, how do microglia become dysfunctional in chronic inflammation? Uh, we know that in early stages of Alzheimer's disease, microglia are able to um, uh, take up amyloid, but in late disease stages, they're uh, unable to um, effectively clear out the amyloid plaques from their environment. Um, and Secondly, uh, we want to ask what are the specific uh, changes in the molecules that are associated with the diverse phenotypes um, in microglia in different conditions? Uh, several gene expression studies, uh, such as single cell transcriptomics, have already identified different subsets of microglia in um, disease and uh, in different conditions. But we are particularly interested in looking at um, the lipids and metabolites in microglia, uh, specifically because these are functional molecules that directly um, affect protein function or signaling events within the cells. So uh, for example, lipids act as ligands for TREM2 and other receptors on microglial cell surface, um, dictating their downstream uh, signaling events. And a class of uh, lipid called as phosphatidyl serines also when they are exposed on the external uh, cell membrane acts as eat me signals for microglia to um, prune uh, neuronal synapses if they're exposed on neurons or also on apoptotic cells, they engulf the dying cells when phosphatidyl serines are um, exposed on the membranes. So this is an, um, a typical structure of a phosphatidyl serine. It has two fatty acid chains and a serine on, in the glycerol um, head. Um, however, this is just one um, class of lipid, right? Uh, diving into some chemistry, uh, we can actually appreciate that there are indeed many different lipid classes. Uh, for example, these are just a few that I have shown on the slide. Uh, for example, phospholipids, there are several different classes of phospholipids based on the functional groups in this R2 position here. So there's phosphatidyl inositols, phosphatidyl cholines, phosphatidyl serines, ethanolamines, and glycerols, and also uh, sphingolipids, uh, for example, ceramides that are um, on primarily on neurons. Um, are also shown here. They have a long fatty acid chain with uh, functional groups. Uh, cholesterol esters, uh, of course, cholesterol is, is huge uh, for microglial function and astrocyte function. And also another neutral lipid, uh, that's triglycerols, which have three fatty acid chains um, linked to the glycerol head. And uh, what we should appreciate in the lipid classes is that the 
there are several different species of lipids within each class. In fact, there are hundreds of species based on the length of the carbon chain or the position of the double bond and whether there is a double bond or not that dictates whether it's a saturated lipid or unsaturated lipid or and the functional groups. And each have their own structure and they, they influence different functions in the cell. So with that in mind, uh, we asked, how can we profile the lipid landscape in microglia, lipid and metabolite landscape in microglia? And specifically, I asked uh, what lipids and metabolites are uniquely made by microglia uh, with amyloid beta. So um, I isolated primary microglia from perfused brains and cultured them in um, take media that was established by Barris Lab. And um, I treated the microglia uh, with amyloid beta and we isolated lipids and metabolites from the cell pellets and also from the conditioned media. And using a very um, sensitive mass spec technique called as MRM profiling or multiple reaction monitoring profiling filing, that's a mouthful, um, we were able to identify different species belonging to different classes of microglia. In fact, we screened around 1400 different lipid species that were organized into 11 different lipid classes. And we also, uh, we have established this method quite well in our lab, and we also have um, bioinformatics pipeline to analyze these large data sets. And this experiment uh, gave us um, large data sets that I have uh, briefly summarized here. So the first thing, um, um, I saw was what were the changes in different classes of lipids with amyloid beta over time. So here we can see that with initial exposures, direct exposures to A beta, X vivo, uh, we can see phosphatidylcholines and sphingomyelins that, uh, that are abundant in the cells, but over time, you know, they disappear. And um, there are other classes that we can uh, look at and ask specific questions. Uh, but more interesting uh, we see here that with initial exposure to amyloid beta, we see abundance of free fatty acids in the cells. However, over time, there's a switch between free fatty acids and triacylglycerols or tags in the cells. And this relationship between uh, free fatty acids and tags is an interesting one because excess accumulation of free fatty acids can in fact be toxic to the cells. So cells have a way of protecting themselves from this overload of free fatty acids by uh, performing esterification, which is a chemical reaction, and which thereby neutralizes the free fatty acids into tags. So this is a kind of metabolic reprogramming by the cells that makes themselves protective with increased exposure to A beta, at least ex vivo. So it would be interesting to translate this to in vivo, uh, where we can uh, extrapolate some of these lipid classes and look at um, the changes occurring within the microglial lipidome. And further, we also um, looked at some of the common lipids and metabolites that were um, expressed uh, with amyloid beta treatment. So phosphatidylglycerols, for example, with 20 and 24 carbon chain lens, which were saturated, uh, were consistently upregulated in microglia. And at the same time, some of these long chain free fatty acids uh, were consistently downregulated. And um, Per the metabolites, there were tyrosines and tryptophans and asparagines that were consistently downregulated. Now, what this all means, uh, we're still trying to, you know, ask fundamental questions about what these lipids are doing in microglia and what are their functions and how can we validate these lipids functionally in the cells. So. Uh, looking at metabolites, we can also look at what pathways are um, affected with the significant metabolites. So which are shown here, some of the significant pathways are highlighted here. For example, alanine and um, aspart aspartate and glutamate metabolism, um, you know, is one of the significant affected pathways. Arginine biosynthesis um, pathways are also affected as shown on the right. So all the metabolites that are involved in this pathway uh, were identified with our MRM profiling mass spec technique. So this uh, rises, you know, this gives rise to a lot of interesting biological questions that we can follow up with.
So with this technique in mind, we next asked, what are the lipids and metabolites that are unique to amyloid beta specific glial subsets? In other words, um, there are phagocytic glia and there's non-phagocytic glia. So what are the differences in the lipid profiles within these glial subsets? And before we could answer that question, um, we needed to be able to specifically look at these A-beta specific uh, glial subsets. So we synthesized a pH sensitive fluorogenic amyloid beta, um, human amyloid beta analog uh, called pH A-beta to identify A-beta specific phagocytic glial cells in, in live glia and in live tissues. So as we see here, um, when the reporter is taken up by uh, the clear, there's an increase in green fluorescence. And one of the good things about this is we can use this for live cell imaging without the need for an antibody. And our collaborators, uh, so Nils and David Atwell's lab has actually used this reporter to show the amyloid beta uptake by cells in a live mouse in, in real time in vivo. So, So as seen here, uh, you know, by creating a cranial window and applying our a -beta, PHA beta reporter, we see an increased uptake uh, of the A beta by cells in, um, in real time in vivo. So to our understanding, this is the first time that A beta uptake has been visualized in live animals in vivo in real time. So using this, um, we also studied A beta uptake in various different uh, animal models. For example, uh, Pablo, again in David Atwell's lab, has used the reporter on acute hippocampus slices and showed David that uh, microglia yeah. take up more. Uh, I'm sorry, I can hear uh, someone speak. I'm sorry. Um, and he's shown that A beta uh, is taken up more by microglia compared to astrocytes. And uh, Emilia from Gottfisch's lab has used the PHA beta reporter and showed uh, by performing stereotaxic um, injection of the reporter, again, over time, that uh, microglia and astrocytes both take up A beta. However, over time, astrocytes you know, lose the um, uh, capacity to take up uh, A beta in vivo. And again, um, it, in another model where um, the A beta was injected into the retina uh, performed by Indigo from Shane's lab, uh, we have again characterized the uptake of the reporter in uh, microglia and astrocytes. And um, Nils, after he visualized the uptake in vivo, he, he could actually fix the tissues and then stain for different cellular markers. and and the fluorescence was retained and we could actually see the localization of the A beta in um, the different cell types, mainly microbian astrocytes and CD68 positive cells. So with this tool now in hand, we are able to, uh, the data that was not shown is we can sort the cells. So please feel free to um, uh, visit, look at our paper that's on bioarchive. So we are able to sort the cells and now look at the molecular changes within um, you know, the phagocytic and the non-phagocytic glial cells. So in my talk today, I have shown for the first time the changes in lipids and metabolites that are um, in microglia that are occurring due to amyloid beta direct exposure. And I have also demonstrated the effectiveness of using uh, multiple reaction monitoring profiling, which is a sensitive mass spec technique to um, characterize the cellular metabolome and lipidome. And we have also demonstrated with all our, all our collaborators that uh, the pH dependent conjugate of A beta can be asked to look at A beta specific phagocytosis in vivo in glial cells. So I should mention that all of our tools and techniques are cell type independent. I am partial to microglia, but uh, we would love to collaborate with anyone interested in using these uh, methods and these tools in your own um, cell models. And ultimately our goal is to, in question of our lab is to ask how do microglia become dysfunctional in chronic inflammation? And we are going to answer that question by looking at different functional molecules that are expressed that directly influence uh, cell function in vivo. 
So with that, I would like to thank uh, first and foremost my advisor, Gaurav Chopra. This is us in 2018 after attending our first CLIA meeting as newbies to the field. And I would also thank like my, uh, thank my thesis committee, uh, Dr. Bruce Lamb, Kavita Shah, and Chris Roshi, members of uh, the lab, John Kripal, uh, my undergrad mentees, Gabby and Liz. And I would like to plug in my live mates poster, poster number 63. So please uh, talk to us in the Slack channel. Uh, Christina for helping with mass spec. And of course, our wonderful collaborators, uh, Nils and Pablo from David Atwell's lab, Kevin and Indigo and Shane, and Emilia in uh, Gore Fisher's lab. And thanks to our funding, agencies and I would be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you. That was fantastic talk. So we got time for a few questions. Um, this one's from Catherine Eskew. She's a postdoc at Edinburgh and she says it's interesting to see the changes in lipid profiles over time. Could it be that cells that can't metabolize FFAs into TAGs become dysfunctional and contribute to pathology? Wow, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, those, that's what we are going after, like what lipids are directly influencing microglial loss of function. So uh, that would be interesting to follow up. Um, finding inhibitors for lipids, actually validating lipids as functional markers is a very challenging question because there are so many subtypes and species and you know isomers of lipids so uh, we're actively working on that and um, you know trying to answer that question all right another question is from a postdoc uh, Julia Albertini um, can your findings be extrapolated to other phagocytic contexts such as development yeah, of course. So as long as it's substrate specific. So I today focused on amyloid beta, but we can make similar conjugates using different chemistries with other neuronal substrates like myelin or tau proteins. So if you are interested in asking specific questions of phagocytosis during development, we can do that. All right. So here's a question from Matthew Mould, a postdoc. Was a beta 42 phagocytose in your CD11B positive microglia cell cultures? And did this affect cell bi viability? Uh, cell viability? Uh, no, because we optimized the concentration to be used um, that would not kill all the cells. So, uh, no. Okay, here's another question from a student. Uh, Suvan Liu. Um, have you looked at the uptake of different A beta states or length using your pH sensitive reporter? No, we have not. So our reporter is very specific to um, the A beta 42, the human protein. So um, unless we make these reporters with different species of A beta, uh, you know, like oligomers, uh, which is again a hard chemistry question, but that would be interesting to explore, but we have not done that. Yeah, this will be the last question uh, from Travis Faust, who's a postdoc. He's curious if, if you have an idea as to whether the change in lipid profile over time is due to changes in the microglial metabolism transcriptome versus different rates of engulfment or degradation of different types of lipid. Good question. Yeah, so we have not looked at transcriptomes. Um, so I don't have an answer for that question, but um, the second part, which was about the changes in uh, function, I believe. So that could be, so we don't know if uh, the function is influencing changes in lipid profiles or if the, lipid pro the changes in lipid profiles are influencing function. So um, again, that comes back to, you know, uh, validating lipids as functional markers, um, which is a very, very hard problem, but that makes it even more challenging. So uh, I do not have a direct answer for that question, unfortunately. That makes it interesting. All right. So uh, thank you for, for a great talk. I think we are, we're on to the next talk.